Ralph went through his surgery with flying colors. Everything's good. And just pray that he has a swift recovery. And Joanne Sackendorf, we hadn't seen her. She should be back pretty soon. She's back at work, which is just a thrill to me to find out that she's driving to work. And that's a good thing. Amen. Y'all ready for it? Father, help us this morning. Lord, help me this morning. Lord, let us be attentive. Let us be receptive. Father, let your spirit speak through us and to us and into us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. We talked last week about a good, good bit of stuff, mainly what does God expect of us? Does he expect anything of us? I found out something with this. I was talking last week and week before about don't let the awakening turn into wokening because they ain't the same thing. You know, you're going to go past. God wants you to live with love being the foundation of everything you say, do, and think. And they always twisted. Everything that God does good is always going to be twisted by the enemy. And at this point, a lot of people went past where I began to go past where I was supposed to go. Don't go beyond where God has taken you. That's an easy thing to do. Sometimes God will be telling you to do something small, and you, we always want to add to it, you know. We always want to add our two cents worth. If we just listen to God and be responsive to, and to, to His voice and His leadership, His Holy Spirit guiding us into all truth, then we're, going, we're not going to get, get in trouble. Well, we get in trouble, though, is when we go beyond what, did God tell you to do that? Well, no. Well, how, that was a pretty big deal for you to do without God telling you to do it. And I'm telling you, the 27 years we've been doing this, I can't count the times I got beyond what God was doing because I was thinking grandeur, and I was just going in that direction of up and more, and I would step out and do things that I would be paying the price for later. It's a lot easier just to let him be in the driver's seat and, you know, how we do it, you know. <laughs> what do y'all think about that? Yeah. I'm, I'm settled and locked in on a lot of things I believe about God, but even the things I'm locked in on, I'm always open to new information. Always. I, in one millisecond, I can, I can change my mind. We have to be that way. We have to be quick to repent. That's what repent means, to change your mind. Paul said that that's how we're transformed, by the changing of our mind, the renewing of our mind. So you've always got to be ready. Don't, don't be so suspicious of everything that you hear that doesn't line up with what you already think you know to where you might be throwing out what God is trying to get to you. I've found out sometimes God can be trying to be getting an answer to prayer to me, but because it isn't what I expected or what I want it to be, I will reject it. And it'll be sometime later where I'll be praying, and I'll, God will I'll sense my spirit when he's already answered it. But when it showed up, it wasn't what I wanted it to be. You know, and so I'd rather it be the way I anticipate it should be. God knows best. Yes. You know, that Stephen show, fathers knows best. That's the truth, y'all. What was the boy's name, Bud? That? Who else? <laughs> Bud, who else was in that show? The faster you adjust to God's leadership, everything, like I say, is sowing and reaping. The faster you adjust to change when God shows you a place where you need some adjustment, the better off you're going to be. That's the closer your harvest is going to be to whatever, whatever that harvest, particular harvest is. The Bible, my favorite book, Jesus is the Word of God. This has the logos of God, the thoughts of God in it. But as Paul says, we have to rightly divide the word of truth. We have to know how to rightly divide or we'll wind up with a God that looks a lot like more, uh, more like us than we look like him. You know, so you have to be cautious about that. The Bible's only been in English for about 500 years. It was translated from Greek and Hebrew by William Tyndale in 1535. And that's not a long time. And this King James Version, which is my favorite, but then I, I look at all of them. I've got just about every translation you can, if I don't have it in hard copy, I've got it here. 
And I love to see what other thoughts are because that's what a lot of it is, is other thoughts. The, the new King James, the King James has been revised so many times. And the things that I have seen that have been changed in it have not been for the good of the, of the gospel, but it is bringing farther away from the gospel. The most important thing that I've noticed over the few years that I point out always, every new revision they do away with another, have the faith of God to have faith in God. That is a huge difference. I had much rather know that I can depend on the faith of God than me having to faith, depend on my faith in God, wouldn't you? But that's changed. The New King James, I think, has done away with all but one of them. But this one has, has I mean, thank God, in Mark chapter 11, um, verse 22, I think, where the King James says, have faith in God. My um, note on it in, in the margin there says, have the faith of God. That's what it should, whenever you see that, that's what it should have been translated. But some, something gets involved in the Bible and gets it further away from God. What do you reckon that is? Jesus doing that? I don't think so. I think we need to always be cautious about those things. We're going to look at, we're going to look at, we're going to open up a sandwich and look, hello? What was that? <laughs> we're going to open up a sandwich and look inside it today. The Sermon on the Mount is, is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Well, in the middle of that would be chapter 6. That'd be where the meat and the cheese and the tomatoes would be. And Tommy, those tomatoes are awesome, man. Those are really good. Tommy Max got some good tomatoes right now, y'all. And blueberries, dear goodness alive, they're good. An onion. He brought me an onion yesterday. It's a pound. And I think it was Luke, Luke Bryan's daddy's to, <laughs> onion. What he built? It. He built it. He got him. He got him a shop out back. It's wired shop. And he builds food. But that it really just does something to me when I see the little subtle changes that are not subtle at all. Who goes along with that? Who, who sets those standards? Really, there's more than, I mean, the King James ber version I have, it just says King James. But I've got a King James that was my grandmother's Bible that has old English in it that, it, that it's called just King James. And so there's been, I think, something like 19 revisions of it altogether. And that's in the 500 years since we've had it. I think it was pro first published in 1611 or something like that, somewhere around there. That's 400 years, isn't it? I don't know. But we're going to be looking at, at Matthew chapter 6. I heard that thing when you'll see like three scriptures in a row and you'll look at the one in the middle and it's sandwiched between two. That is a unique thing that you'll find all through scripture. You'll find a set of three scriptures or three chapters and they'll all sort of be together but the one in the middle will be the, sort of like the special. And the Sermon on the Mount, every word just said was special but I've always liked these things and I'm going to go through the entire um, chapter 6 of, of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus begins by saying, take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Starts off with saying, take heed. The word, the phrase take heed, he uses that a lot in the New Testament. Chapter 11, maybe 10, of the book of Hebrews says you should give the more earnest heed to the things that you have heard, lest at any time they should slip. And that is such an important chapter about messing up and neglecting the ministry of angels in our lives. So it says take heed to these things. Here when it says take heed, the word take, the phrase take heed, it means to pay attention to, be cautious about, and apply oneself to. In other words, get into it. This is something you're fixing to hear that you really need to apply. And he says, take heed that you do not your alms, A-L-M-S. Remember the guy that laid at the gate beautiful all his life and he was crippled and couldn't walk and he was asking for alms. And I heard Charles Cap say this years ago, he was sitting there for years begging for alms and had no idea he was fixing to get some legs. <laughs> but he, he did, didn't he? The word alms goes in line with what Jesus did when someone would get healed. It would say he was moved with compassion. And you look compassion up in the Greek, 
and it means your bowels yearn. We all experience that thing. When we see somebody get hit in the head, it just does something to the inside of us. That's our bowels yearn. That's compassion. We are feeling, we're being touched with the feeling of their infirmity, like the Bible says Jesus is about ours. And that's what the word alms means, com- compassion, compassionateness as exercise toward the pure, a, a benevolence. And when it says poor, it doesn't necessarily mean poor with financial. It could be poor in spirit, poor in, in, in happiness, lonely. It can mean a lot of things that you're poor in. It, when, when you don't have everything that God wants to give you, you're poor in some area. And that's what he says, the alms is when you take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your father, which is in heaven. Well, it says a whole bunch. It's one little sentence. One, it says, has a reward for my father if we don't do it as before men. But I'm telling you, it is the hardest thing in the world to get in the habit. You can get in the habit of doing it. And once you start doing it, you'll be stuck doing it that way. But it's almost impossible to do something for somebody and then not go tell somebody else that you did it. It's almost impossible to do that. Um, we've got, now I have to do it here because I'm, I'm teaching. So I have to tell some of the things that we, but I don't tell nothing like what, what we, our lives about. Those things are between us and God. And that's what a lot of Matthew 6 is about, things, keeping things between God and you. Therefore, when you do thy, thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. They have removed themselves from the laws of sowing and reaping, with the, which are universal, and put themselves into the laws of mankind, where they're getting praise of man and not God. You want praise of man? That's what you're going to get. I stopped years ago. We had some people at church. Every time we would do something, they would call the TV station to come out and film us. And I put, after I figured out that's what was going on, I put a stop to it. That's not the way to do things. God will lift up who he will lift up, and he will put down who he will put down. It's all God's garden. He can raise it the way he wants to. And when we start doing things in order to look good in others' eyes, we've gotten our eyes off God. When we're giving to be seen, you know, you can receive a larger offering if you put the buckets down front and everybody comes down and puts it in the buckets. You'll get about, I think it's 10 to 20 percent increase by doing that. Why? Because people don't want to be not seen putting something in the bucket. It's all sorts of manipulation that the church does. We are to give as if we're giving to God. When you give something to the man on the street that's most likely going to hightail to the liquor store when you give him a 10 or whatever, When you give it to him, you give as unto the Lord. It's none of your business what he's doing. You give to show love. You're not give really to supply him anything. You're giving him money to show him or whatever you give him to show him that there is somebody that gives a doggone about him. That's what that's all about. Showing somebody that somebody does care. What they do with it is their business. We used to be so strict on that. No, we, I, won't put, I won't give you gas money. I'll go to the gas station and put gas in your car. It's none of my business what they're going to do. If they feel like they have to come to, the, to God and lie about what they want the money for, then something is way off base with God's people. Would you agree with me? But you don't want them to go out and get it. It's none of my business what they do. They have a need. And if I can buy them a temporary, some temporary relief, I'm happy to do it. Because I have been in the addicted shoes. I know what it feels like not to have that itch scratched and how miserable it is and how you would give anything. You'll rob and steal and kill just about to get that fix. I know what it feels like. When somebody would give you, it shows love. And that's what you've got to do. You're not, by you withholding your $5 because of what they might do with it, it's not going to change them. But you giving that little $5 to somebody is going to let them see, well, you know, somebody cares about me. Get it? Y'all can agree with me or not agree with me. Or not agree with me. I'm not talking with an accent. Therefore, when you do thine arm, don't sound a trumpet before thee. I had never seen that done around all, but it was a, back when folks used to hang around downtown, there was a city commissioner I knew that used to make a deal out of it. There was a, a guy on the corner of Broad and uh, Washington that was always there, was blind with a cup, and he would always make a deal out of giving him some money and got the post office too. 
but he, he's just putting, I just always noticed that I would be on, man, downtown Saturday used to be, on, on Saturdays used to be happening. Uh, you could go down there and stay all day, go to eat a nice restaurant, shop in the stores, go watch a movie. It was so much fun. I loved Albany. It's just a sad thing to see what's happened. But when thou doest alms, listen to this, what Jesus says, let not your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That means you're writing a check with your right hand, put your left hand in the pocket. I didn't know my left hand could see. I'm, I've got a problem. I'm left-handed. I'd have to get Susie to write a check, and I'll put my hands behind my back. But that's top secret, isn't it? I mean, that, that he's going, he's, he's, he's being, what am I saying? He's be, being over the top with this on purpose to sh- demonstrate the importance of it. When you're doing your own, that you do, that, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which sees in secret himself shall reward thee openly. That's where you have to get to with your giving. You don't, and now sometimes I forget to tell Susie things I did. It's not because I, it would be okay to tell her. She keeps the books in the house, so she needs to know why there's a check missing. Uh, but sometimes she does things and doesn't tell me, but, we do, but if it's, if it's if I'm not teaching, I don't talk about what we do. Uh, that's the way, and it's a hard thing to do. It's all, it's, all of these things are hard not to do. Um, it's, he changes gears now. He goes from giving, and remember, everything is sowing and reaping. And he goes to praying. He says, and when you pray, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. That's all they're going to They're praying to God, but actually what they're doing is wanting men to hear them praying. And I've seen that so many preachers and so many well-intentioned people will start praying and suddenly they begin to speak the king's English using thou. <laughs> and, I, and I've even caught myself doing it. And... Uh, what is that all about? You know, we've got to, God wants us real and honest, and He wants it personal between us and Him. He wants to be that close to us where things go on between you and Him that go on between you and nobody else, and nobody else knows about it, but He's going to look after you when you keep all of that into perspective. Amen. Amen. But when you pray, enter into the closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and the Father which is sees in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, don't use vain repetitions. That's the heathen do. That's, that means the ethnos, the different people. It's talking about everybody that's not Jewish is what it really means here. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. We've all seen people like this. And Father God, Father God, Father God, Father God, Father God, just going on and on, and, and, just, and, and it carries on forever, and not a whole bunch is being said, but a lot is being said. That's again, I believe, not for God, but for men. Look at the next thing says. Um, when you pray, don't use vain rep, as your father do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be ye not therefore like unto them, for your father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. That's awesome. He wants to move you into the area of confession, of saying, saying these things. Father, I need and I believe I receive when I'm praying. Whatever it is. And one place says, let let your petitions be made known. I have actually many times in the past, haven't done it lately, but we used to pray. We used to write down a petition. It's written down. We would write it down and have it in order and come before God like we were in a special courtroom or something and just lay everything out before him. We're not that formal with him anymore. And I don't know that that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think maybe we do get a little too familiar. But it's like talking with God, you know, where the, where the Bible tells us we're to pray without ceasing. You honestly can get to that place. And I am just about there. It's just like constantly between me and God. Everything I hear, I weigh it against what I know about God. And everything I'm, I'm su- supposing I'm getting from God, I weigh it against from God so I'll know that if it's coming from Him or if it's coming from somebody else. There, there's somebody else out there that wants me to get off track, but God wants me to stay on track. He wants you to stay on track. 
You know, but just, you can all turn it around where you're just always talking to God. Be you not like them, for your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, and this is what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. How sacred, how holy is thy name. I heard this prayer explained to me one time by one of my favorite faith teachers. This was probably 35 years ago. And it's the way I've thought about this prayer ever since. He said it should be, he said, if you look it up in the Greek, you will get out of that. This is, be, this is a prayer of thanksgiving. It's not a prayer of petition or asking, but it's, it's a prayer of thanksgiving in the line with what he's already said he's going to give to us. And it's confessing those things to us. And it would sound like this. And we thank you, Lord, that thy kingdom come. And we thank you, Lord, that thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We thank you. Lord for those things. Think about that. That is God's will for things to be in earth like it is in heaven. I'm going to ask you something. How much cancer is in heaven? How much poverty is in heaven? How much violence is in heaven? How much disharmony is in heaven? How many tears are in heaven? And there might be tears of joy for all we know, but no tears of sorrow. But it's God's will that we pray it into the earthly realm. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And you know, when Jesus says that he has given us power to bind and to loose, I believe that you're binding what is already bound out of heaven, and you're loosing what is already loosed in heaven. I heard that one time, and that's the way it is in the Amplified Bible. And so when I pray, I use those concepts also. This is the way, by the way, I study the Bible, which is sin today. And this is a line at the time. It's not just reading it. And while I'm reading it, I'm thinking about Braves, wonder how they're doing, and all those things we do. Which, by the way, they start at 1130 today. What the heck are they doing? <laughs> What's the deal behind that? They're traveling today. They, well, by stagecoach? <laughs> we got planes and stuff now. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And we thank you, Lord, that thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we thank you that you give us this day our daily bread. That's all you're responsible for is what he gives you every day. And he will give you daily bread. I learn something new about God every day. Sometimes it's a lot more than one thing, but if you haven't got to worry about tomorrow or yesterday. Give us this day our daily bread. And we thank you, Lord, that you forgive our debts, forget our, forgive our trespasses, as we in turn forgive our trespassers, those that are in debt to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I thank you, Lord, that you don't lead us into temptation. James says that let no man say when he is tempted that he is tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted of evil, neither tempts he any man. So we know it's not God that's tempting you. And we, so we thank you, Lord, that you don't lead us into temptation, but you deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power. That word power is the Greek word dunamis, where we get dynamite. It's talking about the miracle working power that will change your everything. How many of y'all got some stuff that needs changing? That's what you need right there. And glory forever. Amen. And then immediately he goes back where he was talking about forgiveness. Just like he does in Mark chapter 11, when he finishes that dissertation about you're going to have whatever you say when you pray, believe it, and he says, and when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, so it can open up the, the passage between you and God. It's word, not worded like that, but, and, I'm, and we got a little bit of tussle with, with Scripture on that, and I'll show it to you now. Um, and lead us not into temptation, deliver us evil in the front of us For if I forgive men, their, if, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Well, I've heard people say, well, this was before the cross, because at the cross, while the people were waiting for him to take his last breath, who had put the injuries on him and helped to crucify him and call for his crucifixion, he forgave them. 
They didn't turn him loose. They didn't ask him for forgiveness. Nothing was said, but he forgave. So I've heard it said, well, this is before the cross. I see in the Old Testament, way before the cross, people being forgiven without asking for forgiveness or without giving forgiveness. Okay? Forgiveness is an everyday thing. And faith works by love. How many times have I said over the 27 years we've been doing this that you can't separate love and forgiveness. They're one and the same. If you have something against somebody, therefore you don't love them because there's a charge that you're holding against them. You might not like the way they look, the way they talk, the color of their breath, the color of their skin. You might not like this, that, the other. So you're holding something. You're loving them less, which is what the word hate means. Therefore, you're not allowing yourself to love them. When you forgive them, you allow yourself to love. Forgiveness and love is one and the same. Get a hold of that. If you have not forgiven somebody in your life, you are guilty of murder. I didn't say that. Jesus did. Jesus said if you hate somebody, if you love anybody less than somebody else, then you are guilty. Hmm. So that puts us all in a boat that ain't too fun to be in, is it? Is this making sense to y'all? If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. It's going to be like you're going to have that free flow. If you don't, you're going to think that God is holding something against you. Remember, the alienation is always going to be in our mind. Adam and Eve had not blown it with God, but they thought they had, therefore they had. Do you get it? If you think you've blown it for, with God, then you have blown it with God because it's your confidence that's going to be robbed. It's going to not be there. When you need God, it's your faith. Remember, it's His faith working in us. Have the faith of God. But when you're believing for something, it's going to be hard for you to believe for it when you know these things about yourself. You know something that you've held against somebody for years, and you've talked bad about them to other people. You've tried to get other people in confederation with you to, to not like them the way you don't like them. Those, all those things that we do as humans, you know, to, to keep the us and thing healthy and alive in our lives and the lives of those that we hate and love. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. That is not New Testament. I'm telling you, it's not. You, you just see it. You see it at the cross, and you see it beyond the cross. It doesn't. We ought to forgive, though. But, you know, I, I think I will give you a hint. It'd be a wise thing to go ahead and forgive everybody. Yeah. Yep. But I don't want to. Anything God tells you to do, you have the ability to do because it's hooked up to your soulish realm, which is where your will are. You can will yourself to do it. I, God put it upon me to forgive the person I despise the most. And it took a while, but it worked, and it worked better than I could have ever imagined it worked. They turned out being our closest friends, and they ran our school for 12 years. And this time they were going through the same thing. They were having to forgive me. And that's the way it works. Usually you'll find out when you go to somebody and you're ready to turn loose of something, they're usually more than ready. They've thought about it. Or another thing, they don't even know you got a problem. Sometimes you've got something going on between you and somebody and it ain't missing you all in your head. I've had that happen many times with people. How many of y'all are quick to ask for forgiveness? A couple of us are. You are. <laughs> Can y'all hear my ears ringing? <laughs> then he changes over to, moreover, when you fast. He didn't say if you fast. I'm not going to ask for a hand raising on how many people have fasted recently. Fasting is when you give up something, and it usually should be at the prompting of God. You're doing something to honor God. And what we have used fasting for in the New Testament church is to get God's arm behind his back and try to make him do something. That's the way I have interpreted what I have seen in Christianity. People, well, we want God to do something. We need to raise money for a new sanctuary, so we're going to fast until we get up that $40,000 down payment. We're going to quit eating until... That's like a little boy. I'm going to hold my bread, Mama. Can you give me a bicycle? 
I don't think that's what it's supposed to be like, but I think that's what Christians have used it for in the past. But it says, moreover, when you fast, and, and fast is simply, you understand when you eat your last meal at the, at today, when you eat your last meal this evening, whether you call it supper or dinner or whatever you call it, and then you'll go the longest period of the day between eating. You'll go, you'll go usually around 12 hours before you eat breakfast. Breakfast is breaking fast. That's what that word means. You're breaking a fast from the last night. I don't know all y'all knew that. Moreover, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. You know what I'm talking about. It's so weak. I didn't have anything to eat. I got to sit down. That they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have, once again, they have, they've cut themselves off of God's system and they have their reward. But thou, when you fast, anoint your head, put a little dabble do you on there, and wash your face. Thou that appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which in secret, and the Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, I'm not going to give you a teaching on fasting, but if God, God puts in my heart, we used to fast quite regularly back in the early days of our Christian walk, and we would, we would do, I think, a 72-hour fast was the longest I ever did. And it would be just a water only. I've done a fruit juice only fast, and uh, that don't work. You ended up drinking about four gallons of fruit juice, and then you got other problems. <laughs> uh, sometimes now God will put it on my heart to stop eating. He's dealt with me about sugar that I'm dealing with, those kind of things. And that's between me and him. One of the things that I noticed also in Christianity is when people are fasting, they can't help themselves. They're going to let you know they're fasting. Next time you do it, don't do it. Just like when you give. Anything. These things are, these things are between you and God. And of course, the close person you're closest to, your, your, your mate, or whoever is close to you, you know, that should be able to talk about these things with, with people. But it's not something that you advertise. And Christians like to advertise how spiritual we are. We love to do that. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of women in Albany. I guess they're still around. They, they quit floating by here a long time ago. But they would just come in and like they would be floating on air when they would come in. And they would be the ones that would be throwing handkerchiefs up in the air when, and they'd be praying in the spirit while I'm trying to preach. Had one lady one time, she was writing a book about me while she was here. She was known for her, for her spirituality. But what, what she's really known for is what she thinks she is. She's known for somebody that wants people to think that's what she is. There was a lot of folks like that in Pentecost when we were there. And you have to watch yourself, you know. You have to watch yourself. Sometimes we do get lifted up. We see God's operating in our life. We think that maybe we do have something special going on. We're all the same in God's eyes. And everybody should be the same in your eyes. Amen. And then he gets over into the world system here. And he starts talking about some things that's getting into your business. He said, lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust do corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust is corrupt, and where thieves don't break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Lay it not up for yourself treasures in, on earth. Lay not up for yourself treasures on earth. When we started the church and we did the corporation and all of those things that we had to do within the first 18 months, I think, back in 1996, I, on purpose, did not put in a retirement plan for me. Now, daily, you can hear me kicking myself for not doing that. But I did it because of this scripture. And I, and I truly and truly, it has caused me to know that God is my source. Right now, after being here 27 years, I should be in very good shape. But it also was able for me to cut my salary back down because instead of matching what I'm putting in there, we did none of that. Uh, we, we, if it wasn't for Social Security, thank God my daddy told me the importance. He saw early on that I was one of those that was not going to get through life working for other people. And I did. I opened businesses, and I played music, and I worked for myself, and I did things like that for years and years. And so he taught me the importance of pay, paying my self-employment tax, which is Social Security. And I thank God for it now. 
Our social security is what is making our lives easy now. But he said, lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth. But we do that. But there's so many people that thought they had it made. They thought they had three quarters of a million dollars in the bank. They were going to live a happily ever after. And then that thing happened back in the 90s. And suddenly they, their stocks went all down. They sold them. They took them out of loss. Those things are about to happen again right now. I, my advice to you, if you got money in the bank, I'd say get it out of the bank. The banks are collapsing. Me and Susie, what little bit we had, it's, it's not in the bank. I want so bad to take the church's money out of the bank, but I don't know what that would look like to the per per folks at the bank. But I, the banks are collapsing, folks. I don't know if you know that. The financial system is collapsing. And there are a lot of people that have their savings in intangible things, in investment plans and things like that, who are not going to come out good in this thing. I thank God that over the last 40 years, Susie and I have been in a place put there by God himself where he, we have learned to trust him. And when you, trust, when you learn to trust God, you have to learn how to sow. You have to learn how to water the seed that you sow with your mouth. And when you learn these things and you begin to see the numbers don't matter. Your situation is what matters, and God can change things without your finances changing one penny, but he can change things. He can also change your finances. My goodness, how many times has just suddenly happened in this ministry right before it looks like what's going to happen, and then suddenly somebody will come up. I, I wish I could tell you some stories, but, I, but the people don't want me to tell them. But, I mean, big, big-time stories happened a couple of times over in the round room. I had somebody come up to me one day after a service. We didn't know what we were going to do. I had been at the bank putting things on my credit card to pay things, and somebody came up to me and gave me a check for $90,000, and, and there was another guy that said he wanted to have lunch with us. We went to lunch with him after that day, and that guy gave us another 80000 That was in one day. It, it kept that church, kept us over there for another year. It did. And then we went a year without paying payments on it. We couldn't do that. And then it happened here. It's happened here several times. It's happened right now. God looks after us. But the Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men heap unto your bosom, into your, into your purse. And that's the way it is. God uses people. He's not up in heaven counterfeiting money that's going to drop out of heaven. He's going to use somebody to get the harvest to you. Always. You got it? Well, I just don't believe that. Well, you ain't got to worry about it working in your life. It, in fact, is working backwards in your life. It's like you got a hole in your pants. You put 50 cents in and only get a quarter out. <laughs> Boy, we live like that forever. I'm talking about before with God, we were always the people, we were the last people to buy the car. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And I, I finally figured out, when you go look at a car and they tell me, well, it's got a new fuel pump, it's got a new transmission, we rebuilt the engine, it's got a new brakes just redone. What is happening is the car is falling apart so fast they can't stay on top of it. There comes a time when it's time for the graveyard for all vehicles. And that's, I would be the guy that would take it to the junkyard. <laughs> but now, thank God, we got a car we can depend on. And that, that, when we first got that, I think it was an 89... Um, Explorer. I'm so proud of that car. And this was in 96. It was an 89 Explorer. I was so proud of it. We could go have a car. We knew we could get it all the way, at least to the beach and back. <laughs> I, I tripped to the beach on the side of the road most of the time. Cars <laughs> overheating. Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yes. I guarantee you one thing I had in every car I owned. That'd be a set of jumper cables. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth. A lot of people have really nice retirement, but don't, let, don't look to that as your source. Continue to look to God as a source. I am really, when I said I kicked myself for not setting that up so many years ago, where I was putting into a retirement fund, so the church was, and I, me also, I am truly glad that I'm in a place where I have to do what I'm doing. I'm serious as I can be. I, I, I'm happy that I'm in a place where I have to be dependent upon God 
to make it month to month. That's a good place to be. That's where he wants us. That's what this is all about. Everything he's teaching us is teaching us how to depend on him. You can cast all of your care on him. For he cares for you. Psalm 91 is about him caring for you. Mark 12, Mark 4, Mark, Matthew 12, Matthew, Mark, Mark, Mark chapter 11 is all about how he wants to care for you. He said, therefore I say unto you, when I'm back up, da, 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 da. lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust does corrupt and when thieves, do, when thieves do not break in to steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I can name, and I think it's been long enough, the family doesn't live here anymore. When Susie and I began to take care of Sue and look after her, she was so aggravating to us, we got to where we couldn't stand to be around her, and we began to see about her. We began to, and the more we began to see about her, the more we began to soften. We began to soften our feeling toward her. And I went and actually, she had been on the streets, she'd been using opiates. We found a way that she could walk opiate free, and I helped her with that financially. Um, I, they put her apartment on, I'm, most again, I'm not telling this for a pat on the back, I'm telling you for what happened with us. I, put, I went to Larry Walden at Walden and Kirkland. I said, this lady in our church needs a place to live. And so they ran my credit line and put it in my name. And she was to make the payments. She had never been able to make payments. And she's 60 years old and never made payments on time in her life. She made her payments every month beforehand. And she would call us up the day before that it was due and say, I made my rent payment today. And that person that we were at first resenting, we fell absolutely in love with, and we miss her like we miss a close relative now that she has passed. I found, I found her body the day that we got news that my son had died. That day my son died, and that day I found her on her floor in that apartment. And we have treasure in heaven with her. We invested in her. We took time up with her. I'm not boasting. I'm teaching you something. And we became the recipient of her love. And when you're a recipient, we love people because they first loved us. We begin to love her with a true, clean, pure love straight from God. And we're the ones that are recipients of that reward also. And there are other people now. Good gracious. I, we got to spend a little time with, with another homeless guy Friday morning. And we were just laughing and having a good time talking. Somebody that we've now grown to, somebody we didn't, didn't want anything to do with, but the Lord says, he's, why? Because we had put him in the least of these category. He was the least of these in my eyes. Why can't he take care of himself? Because he was the least of these, but we begin to. I found out that's where you find Jesus. Yeah. Amen. So that's how you lay up treasures in heaven, by investing in people. That's the way I see it. Then he changes again. He says, where your treasure is, your heart shall be. I, I know a lot of people whose treasure is their bank account, and they, there's a wide gap between them and God. I know a lot of people whose treasure is their bank account, what they have amassed over the years, or what they've inherited over the years. And when they talk about God, they talk in a fearful relationship with God about they're doing things because God is watching them. You know, they do things out of motivation of love. Amen. I didn't know it was this late. I got to move on. Then he changes. If thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. What in the world does that mean? If therefore the light that is in thee is darkness, what, how great is that darkness? If in thine, the light, I missed this whole thing, didn't I, here. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. What does that mean, be single? We're living in the time, I've pointed out several times of Isaiah 6, your eyes shine for thy light is coming, the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. And darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, thick darkness the people. We're seeing that now. And he says, if your eye be single, then there will be light in your body. That's talking about you, the, the, 
glass is half full, not half empty. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. All things do work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. I do have what I say, and I speak positive things. That's the I being single, not double-minded. Well, I just don't know if it's going to work. James, Jesus' half-brother said, a double-minded man, double man is unstable in all his ways. Let not this man think he will receive anything of God. We have to be single-minded about the things of God. It's got to be always, yes, Lord, yes. Never maybe. Never I sure hope so. That's the most, that's most of the faith of most Christians I know. Well, did you pray? Yes, I prayed. Do you believe God's going to answer your prayer? I sure hope so. <laughs> what you really say is probably not. When you say that, you say most likely not. Say, in, in Jesus' name, yes. I believe I receive when I pray. Now I'm going to go home and I'm going to clear a place to put that shed or whatever I'm believing for. Listen, let me tell you something. You want God to do more? Take care of what you got. Clean, wash your car. Clean your house up. Fix what you have and watch God say, okay, if he's going to take care of that, you've got to be a good steward of what he's already blessed you with. These things are principles that we have to live by. Do you understand that? I think I went to meddling then. <laughs> no man can serve. Oh, wait, let me back up on this one. For if your eye be evil, then the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that be thee in thee is darkness, how great is thou darkness? What does that mean? A lot of people think they're enlightened when they're woke. But the light that is in them is not light at all. It is gross darkness. You get it? The light that is in them, they believe, they see things other people don't see, and they believe it with all their being. But how dark is that? Okay, now we'll get on to the next thing that Jesus starts talking about. And he's, all he's talking about, he's talking about this world system and you operating in it right now. And he says, no man can serve two masters. Either he's going to hate one and love the other, or else he's going to hang on to one of them and despise the other. But you better get it in your hat, put this in your pipe, and smoke it. It is impossible to serve God and mammon. The word mammon is the Greek word that was never translated. It's mammona, mammonos, something like that. And it, it, it's being confidence in wealth, putting your confidence in wealth. It's wealth personified. Remember, God blesses us that we can be a blessing. We're to have our ha hands like that, not like that. Right? Wealth personified, avarice, extreme, which, is, which means extreme greed for wealth and material gain. If you understand your place as a blesser, it's okay to have that extreme greed for wealth and possession because you are a vessel that is going through. A lot of people are like that. A lot of people, they know they are here to finance what God is doing, and they go about their business doing it, and their wealth just continues to grow. But here we go. It says you cannot serve man, God, and mammon. Mammon is this world system that we have been trapped in for centuries. It's gotten now where it's been fine-tuned back in the 50s. There was a plan for everyone in Western civilization. It's different all over the world, but in Western civilization, there were expectations about us. We go to school this many years. We turn our children over to strangers for all these hours a day, and they learn all of these things. And then at a certain age, we are to go off to a college. Then we're to come back. We're to get a, find a, a mate, get married, buy a home settle down, have a 30-year mortgage. About the time you pay your house off, you'll be, you paid, you actually paid like $480,000 for a house you paid $150,000 for because of the, the crooked interest. interest rate that's going on. Honey, all that's fixing to stop, y'all, I'm telling you. I mean, just remember that you heard it from me. It's going, to, that's going away, and I'm hoping it's pretty soon. And then by the time you finally get old enough to retire, hell, you die. Yeah. I mean, they, they got it figured out. And what are we here for? We are here to be consumers yeah. for the ones that are doing this, for the puppeteers, the God of this world, the princes of this world that Jesus talks about. And he's saying, you cannot serve that crowd and my crowd. 
you can be, um, what do you call that horse? Um, that, you, that you know, the horse had all the armies inside of him. Trojan horse. You can be that. You can you can be somewhere and know that you're there on a mission. And in fact, I believe a lot of people are there. You're there on a mission. You're, that's suddenly your vocation becomes your avocation. You suddenly are a minister at your job. You're there for other reasons. Amen. You cannot serve. It's impossible to serve God and this world system. Therefore, I say unto you, because of that, I'm going to show you. God says, I'm going to show you how you go about depending on me. Take no thought for your life. What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or yet for your body, what kind of clothes you're going to put on. In life more than meat and the body than raiment. And we, that's about it. That's all they had to worry about back then. We've got everything. How are we going to pay insurance? How are we going to pay utility bill? How are we going to pay the mortgage? All the things they've got us trapped in. You know, like right when I was talking about a little while ago about I think it's the wise thing to get your money out of the bank. Well, the money's insured up to $250,000. Do you know who insured that? Who has that insurance company? The FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance, something or another. The FDIC is a private company. It's the same folks that own the National Bank. It's the Fed. The Fed is not part of the government. These are private corporations. So the people that are going broke are the people that are going to be paying you $250,000. It's not a government organization, y'all. Do a little research on these things. They've got us by the... <laughs> Help me, somebody. Short hairs? I don't know. What's they say? I want to ask you something. How bad would it worry if you, can't, if you go there and you have clothes on the door? <laughs> We, we try to leave in the bank what we need to get through the month. You understand? What it takes to get through the month, the mortgage and everything. And actually we have, we have on hand a couple of months mortgage, three months I think. That's a, that's a right way to do these things, you know. Um, why well, take thought for a minute? Uh, where am I at with this? Therefore, I say, take no thought of your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink for your body. And I brought it up to date with you know, the things we have to worry about now. And then Jesus says, behold, the birds, they sow not, neither do they reap. They're not participating. They don't have the, the privilege of participating in the, the things that you do. Nor do they gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you taking thought can add one cubit unto his statue? How can, if you might think you're too short and you want to, mm, I want to be taller. Me and Susan have been married close to 50 years. For 50 years I've heard her complain about her being too short, and I'm telling you she ain't grown an inch. Truth is, I think we're both shrinking a bit. Why take thought for clothes? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil, they don't spin, they ain't got a sink or soul machine. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. Wherefore God, if, if, he, if he so clothes the grass of the field, and we've just gone through the most beautiful spring in South Georgia with the azaleas and camellias and dogwoods everywhere, and oh goodness, all the, the pretty um, magnolia blossoms on slapping. And it says, if, uh, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, and the sun's going to be up and it's going to dry up, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought. And then he tells how you take the thought. By saying. That's the problem. He says, do not take. You can have the thought. You can have the thought. I don't know how we're going to get through. I don't know how. You can have it. But you take that thought and it becomes a seed on the inside of you that will lead to naught. That will lead to nothing when you take the thought. And he said, don't take the thought by saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? How are we going to be clothed? How are we going to pay this bill? How are we going to get the car fixed? I know it needs this done too. What do we got to do about that too? How are we going to do these things? Don't take the thought saying. There's another time when Jesus says, we're going to give an account on every idle word 
that is spoken. Flawless is an idle word. It's a thought that's not spoken. But as soon as you speak it, it's not an idle word. You have popped the clutch on it. And then the power, it's going to be the power to bring about bad that's going to come to pass. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. You cannot get away from that. You can't get away from it. And I guarantee you 98% of the churches in this town do not believe that's true. And it's one of the most important truths you can ever get to know. And, and Jesus is talking to people that understand these things here. He's talking in line with that when he says these things. Therefore, take no thought saying. And then that parenthetical statement, the next one, for after these things do the Gentiles seek. That's sort of like a, a racist statement, I think. What he's saying is it, it, uh, it, it's, that was put there by the translator, not the original. Whenever you see something that's in, we don't have anybody doing that today. Um, when you see something in parentheses, that was added by the translator usually. Um, for your heavenly Father knows you have need of all those things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And the word should, should be justice. It should be justice. It is justice in Dewey Reigns 1852 version. For some reason the King James folks thought they should tra translate it righteousness. And then we misunderstand what that means. Righteousness literally means you're in right standing with God. There's nothing blocking the two of you. Everything is okay between you two. And it's because of God's justice. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his justice. The kingdom, remember Jesus said the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is within you. So it's close by. It's, it's you. You are the kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's got to be your priority. And his justice. His justice is always going to be restorative. It's always going to be fixing what you broke. Not punishing you for breaking it. On the cross, what did Jesus do? His justice was to forgive his murderers. So we're to seek the kingdom of God and God's justice. Look the word up and get your Strong's Concordance and look up these words. It's fun to do that. Yeah, you can just download an app where you punch on the word in the, in the King James and it'll bring up the Greek or the Hebrew, whatever, if you're in the Old or New Testament. Wow, I hope y'all got something out of that. But seek ye first the king. That, that statement right there, when we bought our house 17 years ago, somebody had put a plaque on the bedroom door. And if I took the plaque off, there'd be some holes in the door. And I went and got a plaque made up of that, of, of Matthew, uh, Matthew 10, 33, 633. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. It's on our bedroom door. That's such an important scripture. When you prioritize your lives and you understand the importance of, of walking the love walk with everybody, the ones you want to and the ones you don't want to. And when you do that, all these things will be added unto you. I'm here to tell you, church, when you do these things like Jesus is talking about in the meat of the Sermon on the Mount here, when you live your life this way, between you and God, prioritizing your life with Him and doing things not, not for the glory of men, but just so God, only God knows about it. The stuff that you're seeking after and you need will just flat show up. How many of y'all have experienced that? It, it's, that's the way we live. Somebody shows up with it, or it shows up, or it was, I had it all along and didn't know I had it. We, we find that kind of stuff happening all the time. God is teaching us how to depend on him completely. And that's his desire. When I asked last week about what does he desire of us, what does he require of us, what does he expect of us, we are to be the contributing factor to his successful earth mission. I believe that. And the Bible tells us that Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The thief came not but for to kill, steal, and destroy. It says, for this, this purpose was the Son of God manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Well, it was one back at the cross. It was an uh-oh moment when the devil couldn't uncrucify him. He had already crucified an innocent man. And the man willingly did it and willingly forgave them. Forgave them all. So it set the whole thing upside down. And now he's having, we got all power has been given to us now. On the day of Pentecost, we were endued with power from on high. And it's our faith. Jesus always said, your faith has fixed you. Your faith has made you whole. And that's what's going on now. The devil has been using your power 
to have things go wrong in your life. No more with me. Absolutely not no more. We are going to enforce the defeat that God did. We're the body of Christ. We are Jesus' body. Get that thought in your head and nail it down. Amen. John 5, 30, the words of Jesus needs to be the words of you. I can of of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I I decide, I judge. And my judgment is just. That's that word just that is also translated righteous a lot of time. This time King James got it right. and, And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has set me. I wonder what his, what his will would be to want to knock him upside the head too. He was a man with temptation just like us. Amen? Amen. Last, that little poem I said last week has been just ringing in my ears, and it's so true, the importance of it. I sought my God, and my God I could not see. I sought my soul, and my soul eluded me. I sought my fellow man, and I found all three. That's the entire Sermon on the Mount wrapped up in a two-second format. Amen. Did y'all get anything out of this? I didn't mean to go over this far. Um, listen to it again. Get, and stop, stop the, uh, whatever you listen to on, you can find them on my Facebook page or YouTube, lcci.us. Um, and, when you, and look up the scripture in the Bible. Get your Bible to go along with it. And, and catch a hold of these things. When you begin, when that, that transformation begins to take place inside of you, it is like nothing else you'll ever experience. I, I, I feel like sure most of you have experienced it when God begins to transform you and you see that a change has happened that you didn't do. It had to be God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Y'all continue to pray, pray for Ralph that he be doing good.